and welcome to RegenMed Global, the podcast. Um, in this episode, we will be discussing a major study about stem cells and uh, multiple sclerosis. Leading this study, we have Dr. Demetrios Krusis. Uh, Dr. Krusis, it's great to go ahead and have you. Thank you for joining. Before we get started, can you tell us a little bit about what you do? Thank you very much for this opportunity to talk about uh, our research because I do believe that this is a, a very a big opening of a big window uh, in this uh, new era that uh, hopefully will be regenerative medicine. So I'm the head of the Multiple Sclerosis Center and the unit of neuroimmunology at uh, Adassa University Hospital in Israel. And for many years, I think it's now almost 20 years, I'm uh, uh, dealing with uh, research of uh, adult stem cells and uh, very specialized adult type stem cells, the missing chemo stem cells in neurological conditions, conditions, but especially in multiple sclerosis. So uh, we're proud that we have uh, all these years done uh, at least three clinical trials and we have gained maybe the greatest experience uh, in the clinical application of this kind of uh, treatments uh, as a possible future therapeutic approach in diseases like multiple sclerosis and not on. In this study that you and your team did in regards to MS and stem cells, can you give us a little bit of just like an overview of the design study and what you were ultimately trying to accomplish? Phase two studies, what uh, has to be uh, compared, we have to, in, in this kind of studies, we have to compare the real treatment, which is the injection of stem cells, with what we call placebo. I mean, half of the patients should then see something that is, again, similar to the, to the treatment, but uh, it's just normal cell lines, just no nothing. Uh, and when we have a pill uh, for placebo, we use something that contains just glucose. Uh, when we have cells, it's more complicated, but we did the lumbar puncture to every patient, uh, and in those who had to receive placebo, we injected just uh, not cells, but just normal cell life. But uh, since this would be uh, not fair for half of the patients, we did uh, what we call a crossover uh, design, which means that after six months, those who received placebo turned to the real cells. Uh, all this study, in order to be uh, devalidated, it has to be in a double blind way, which means that neither us as physicians nor the patient knew what they received. This was automatic, it came by in, uh, you know, uh, um, a computer which provides uh, numbers and the type of fall, the cells that uh, the therapy that every patient has to be seen. And uh, in this way, we can be sure that we do not have any bias in order to interpret the effects of the treatment. So, this uh, uh, ten, phase two uh, of phase two study, which is a double VI, and this is a full of great, but we need if on testing the thickness of the treatment. Uh, it was um, completed in 2018 with 48 patients, it's a good number of patients. Half of them, as I mentioned, treated uh, a third of them, treated with placebo and two thirds with uh, two ways of administration per se, either into the service partner from or into the blood. And then we have uh, to analyze, we had to analyze and lot this data from the long money year follow up of the patients. The results were astonishing and were published in one of the major your words come Jordan it's called the brain, uh, and so that uh, more than 50% of the patient were completely free of the activity of the disease, those who received themselves in the cell of kind of fluid, as compared to only 8% in the placebo group. So it's a huge difference. And this uh, was the similar also to the same direction with all the other parameters, including urological improvement, which was in about 35 to 40 percent of the patients, as compared to almost zero in the placebo, uh, very uh, significant changes in their activity in the MRI, and um, beneficial, of course, in the group of uh, receiving the intrathecal injection that came to the cerebral panel through the uh, stem cells, and also in the cognitive tests, in uh, what we call uh, also testing uh, for the eyes, and uh, even uh, even uh, in the biomarkers, uh, which are specific blood examinations that evaluate the level of uh, the degree of degeneration and regeneration, the damage in the nervous system. 
So all this study was um, uh, was finalized by highly positive um, uh, result, and this uh, provided uh, the basis to organize now because this is the final step a multi center which is called the center a study that will be in which will be uh, um, for many many medical centers in the world should uh, be included. So there will be indeed patients now, and this is what we're organizing. It's going to start in the next months for major centers in the United States and uh, one or two our center and one more probably um, in uh, uh, another country in Europe. So it would be at least five or six medical centers and uh, a number of patients would be uh, uh, around 100 in order to validate in this way and finalize our conclusions about the efficacy of these treatments. But I think that we went too far without explaining what is exactly this type of cells. The biggest uh, source of uh, all kinds of stem cells in all body is the bone marrow. And that's why in our studies, all these years, we are taking the stem cells, which are called missing chemo stem cells, from the bone marrow of the patient, and then we catch them with spotting tens of millions, more than 100 million cells, and then we can inject them. This is the type of the cell we're using. Is it like a one-time treatment that's given, or is it given kind of every so often? Can you tell us a little bit about that? This is a very good question because uh, we do not have the definite answer yet. Uh, so in order to have some first indication, uh, in our uh, study that I mentioned, the, the phase uh, two study, which was a double blind design, as I mentioned, we tried to compare one injection versus the second injection after six months. And there was a very strong indication that the second injection enhanced those uh, beneficial effects. And then we had also some additional indications when um, we tried to uh, to use to make a follow-up study, and this is now ongoing. And um, I can uh, can provide you some of the information the, of the interim data we have until now. And we try to even reduce this interval between the injections to three months. And we did we do see that, uh, uh, of course, we will not succeed in every patient to do it every three months, but. In half of them that particular who participated in this clinical trial, we are trying to do a kind of protocol uh, of with intervals of three to four months. We do see that the effect starts to go down after three to four months, not in all of the patients, uh, and uh, this comes uh, in parallel with some observations we have from the animal models that the viability of the cells that we inject is not, you know, so uh, long. Uh, as we thought. So, I mean, the cells can survive for, for a few months, but not uh, for years. So definitely, and according to all the data we have from the studies until now, it seems that we have to use additional or repeated injections. However, uh, the correct uh, interval time is not uh, yet enough. For instance, I think that it depends and it will depend also on the severity and the activity of the disease in each specific patient. For instance, in diseases that progress very fast, like ALS or other degenerative conditions, maybe even every two to three months there should be an injection. In diseases that are more chronic, like uh, multiple sclerosis, maybe every six or even every 12 months, it would be a good uh, um, a treatment uh, protocol. So this is something that you have found out now in this uh, new study that we are preparing. Once the injection is done, how so, how long does it take for um, for it to start being effective? Uh, we have seen until now a double uh, effect. First of all, an immediate effect that uh, starts uh, you know even the, from the first second day after the, of the injection, and this is uh, uh, has a logical explanation that uh, these cells produce huge quantities of uh, growth factors. So uh, when they are injected, they start to do something immediately. But of course, these uh, growth factors very f disappear very, very fast, and they cannot uh, provide the long-term effect. And then we have a second wave of improvement, which starts uh, from uh, the first month and over the, the, the weeks uh, after these first months. And I think that um, uh, we have seen that uh, we have... Uh, a peak of this kind of second wave of effect 
at uh, between one to three months and then it goes down. This is the first observations that we have has in terms of uh, how long the treatment uh, can take to to show its effect. What would you ultimately conclude in terms of the results and benefits of using the stem cells on a treatment uh, on a condition like MS? Um, you know, it's very difficult to draw conclusions from uh, uh, this kind of uh, this number of patients, which uh, even in the bigger study, which included 48 patients, still not enough. So since not all of them responded in the same way, but uh, the good news is that all of them were in the positive uh, way. So there were cases and some of them uh, with very impressive improvements. And this was to us uh, something very surprising. And uh, because, um, as I mentioned, the axioma we had uh, as neurologists and the scientists that uh, when we have a long-standing disability uh, from a brain condition or a nervous system condition, this is usually after one or two years is irreversible. And we found that uh, there were cases in few of the patients uh, injected with the stem cells that um, even uh, a significant paralysis of the hand or, or of the leg that was uh, for five or 10 years could improve. And this uh, gave us, uh, in addition to our surprise, gave us a lot of hope for the possibility of, as I mentioned, of um, uh, starting to reverse even long-standing uh, disabilities. So as I mentioned, this was not the case in all of the patients. So of course, that's why in medicine we need larger studies and larger number of patients, and this is what we're going to do. But uh, there are still questions whether there, it might be that the quality of the stem cells which we take from each patient are a little, uh, it's not uh, the same uh, from each one, maybe from genetic reasons or whatever. So uh, it could be that, and this is something that we have to evaluate, that we have to find out uh, why some of the patients are so impressively improving and others less, and find out whether this is related to the quality of the stem cells in each case. So in, theoretically, uh, if we found that this is the problem, then we might start also thinking about transplanting cells from another soul, from another uh, healthy donor, because we do not do any any invasive, uh, and just to take the bone marrow uh, and to aspirate the bone marrow, which is not a major procedure. Yeah. Now, what are like the risks of doing a treatment like this? Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the first uh, uh, aim of the first study was to, to check up the safety. And I believe that now we have accumulated uh, data from uh, at least um, 150 or more patients and a very long follow-up of at least 15 years. And we haven't seen any serious adverse event that is worth mentioning. Uh, and this is, uh, of course, uh, extremely good because um, uh, we in every, we know that in every treatment there are uh, there are um, side effects from immunotherapies and other ways of uh, other types of uh, possible uh, uh, de risks for cancer or whatever in our case we have we are st still we're continuing to follow up those patients and haven't uh, seen anything which is major the minor things that uh, since we do this uh, injection of the cells with a lumbar puncture, uh, we do so, we do observe sometimes that there is a kind of uh, an irritation of the central nervous system, a transient headache. Sometimes there was some fever, and uh, all these were trans transient signs and uh, uh, the, with fast recovery. And in the long term, as I mentioned, we haven't seen anything, and I think that this is. Uh, uh, logical, since we do not do any any immunosuppression of the immune system, we do not use chemotherapy, we do not inject uh, foreign cells, but uh, the, the uh, cells from the, the body which are existing in the, the, the body of the patient. Is there a first ever about this treatment that you guys have done that hasn't been done before? Absolutely. I think that uh, this type of stem cell treatment uh, it is only done uh, during these years, uh, and especially in our center. And um, 
I think that uh, uh, all the other types of uh, uh, stem cell injections are either in um, uh, using the metopoietic stem cells, just, you know, what we call bone marrow transplantation with chemotherapy, or uh, other types of unidentified types of stem cells which are less um, controlled and identified uh, as compared to our in our case. As I mentioned, we did this step by step, so we have built uh, the basis for using this type of cells when we saw what are the mechanisms and how they act in the animal models and how they can rebuild the myelin and the regenerate. And that's why we are confident that this is a very good uh, uh, type of cell to use. On the other hand, indeed, you are right that there are also uh, additional, this kind of adult in this category, the group of uh, uh, adult stem cells that um, uh, including neuronal stem cells or from other tissues like the fat uh, uh, that we have uh, in our body. Uh, but these are less tested, and especially in the case of embryonic or neuronal stem, stem cells, the risks are much higher because they have greater potential to proliferate and probably produce um, cancer or tumors. So I think that the risks with other types of stem cells is higher. Uh, and this type of, uh, I think this is the golden compromise to use this type of cells that we are using among the other populations of stem cells. Is there any kind of finishing thoughts or kind of final thoughts that you have that you'd like to go and share? Um, yeah, uh, I think that uh, um, there's a lot of confusion around uh, the stem cells. And uh, of course, it's called like what we called in uh, ancient Greece, panakia. It's not panakia for everything. It's not the, the solution for everything. And, it's, and, it's, and at least until now, so there is a big exaggeration about uh, and uh, you know what we call stem cell tourism and many people go to all kinds of places uh, all over the world trying to uh, take uh, so-called stem cell treatments and I believe that this gave us also gave the whole field a very bad name which is not good uh, so we we do not have to exaggerate to this direction but when we are based on the results in academic institutions and the results that are done in a proper academic scientific way, and indeed there are many of them, including those that I mentioned from our center, then we can be absolutely definite and positive and very optimistic that we, although we do not have reached the solution for regeneration of the brain and the central nervous system in chronic diseases like multiple sclerosis, but, we, but surely we have opened a new window to an era which hopefully will be the regenerative, regenerative medicine, especially in neurology. And uh, uh, then in these cases, we can uh, control better and improve disability, even in chronic diseases, not only multiple sclerosis, but every neurological condition. Uh, uh, but uh, the way is still long until this will be an everyday treatment. We do still to answer, have to answer several questions. What would be, as I, you mentioned, the intervals between the injections? What would be the ideal optimal number of the cells injected? What would be the specific type of cells that has to be used? But in general, as I mentioned, when someone opens the door or the window to this direction, then by good collaborations and high quality of studies, we can proceed much faster and in the previous year, and indeed provide new hope for all these chronic diseases. Dr. Cruces, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for sharing all this information. Um, it was very valuable. Thank you very much for giving this opportunity to me, and uh, I hope uh, that we can have the possibility to have a follow-up on when we will have more results.